Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good morning to you, brothers and sisters. It is surely early this morning. So if you hear me pausing often, it's to take a sip of coffee. I apologize, but it's early. Uh, here we go again. A uh, short study on the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord that will come like a thief in the night. Uh, this particular uh, study tool that I've created for you to use um, I, I really think you're gonna like it uh, the tools that I create on the day of the Lord I believe my personal opinion are getting better every time I create one what I've really learned over the past week in my studies of the day of the Lord and what does it mean comes like a thief in the night and behold I am coming as a thief what do they mean well, the Lord has shown me this week that you really need to incorporate the book of Hosea into your study of the day of the Lord. If you don't, um, it won't make total sense to you, and you'll see exactly what I mean. Uh, uh, some people are familiar with Hosea chapter 6, talking about the return of Jesus and how he gives us a clue that he's going to do it after 2,000 years from the time he left us. That's Hosea 6, verses 1 through 3. But you really need to incorporate Hosea chapter 2 and Hosea chapter 5 into your study of the day of the Lord if you want to understand why it starts at the sixth seal and why it climaxes with the actual appearing of Jesus Christ at the seventh bowl. So if you really want to understand it and teach it correctly and how the day that brings about the return, the appearing of Jesus, the day itself comes like a thief in the night, and why the actual appearing after the sixth bowl gathering of the nations, why the appearing of Jesus also comes uh, well, Jesus comes by, as a thief. So how do they differ? And what's really going on at the sixth seal when the Lord says, I will come upon you as a thief? But yet he's not talking about his actual appearing. So again, my point is, if you incorporate Hosea 2 and Hosea 5 into this study, you'll really see word for word, what Father is doing at the sixth seal. He won't bring Jesus until the seventh bowl. So in Hosea 2 and Hosea 5, you're going to see God the Father actually, actually telling us, hey, I'm coming, I'm going to remain cloaked. All right, no one's going to see me. They may feel my presence. But when I bring Gog the Assyrian, the final Antichrist, and his army horde upon Israel, and I visit them with sudden destruction to start the day of the Lord. After I get things initiated, Father tells us he's going to return to his place, to his throne room, and he's going to watch the events or continue watching the events because Daniel chapter 7 the chapter about the courtroom in heaven that's actually sitting, Father and the 24 elders are watching the events on planet Earth for 42 months. But they actually begin watching before the sixth seal. They start watching the moment they, that Father cast Satan to Earth in Daniel 11, 36. I believe 30 days after the abomination of desolation event in Daniel 11, 29 through 35. Once Satan is cast to earth, that starts the 42 month period. It leads up and counts down to Father's verdict at the seventh trumpet, which is day 1290. Okay? And then day 1335 is the resurrection and the rapture, the mustering of the Lord's army for battle. That's what it is. It's a fight to the finish. And then, after the fight is done, then Jesus can receive his inheritance that Satan was trying to steal. And then we could begin building, you know, and especially for the labor of the nations, the remnant of the nations that surround Israel. 
will go under Israel's control and they will come and they will help build Jerusalem back up and build up the, the highways and such so people can pilgrimage to Jesus to worship him. So, yeah, let's go ahead and see what I have here for you. Let's go over some, some scriptures. And uh, again, we're going to incorporate Hosea 2 and Hosea 5. And it's really going to help us make sense how Father comes. He remains cloaked. He orchestrates the start of the curse, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, I believe that Father and the 24 elders have already been watching for 16, 17 months during the fifth seal uh, after they uh, after father cast Satan to earth and then 15 or 16 months later now it's time for the end to come upon my people and it's time for I will come upon you as a thief and father actually comes and orchestrates the start of the curse the day of the Lord that sudden destruction upon his people to purge away and to take away their dross and alloys, says Isaiah chapter 1. All right, let's see what I got. So I start out in the top center with a question. You can barely see it. That's why you need to always save my PNG files as a picture so you can zoom in and out. Right here, I have a question for you. Which moment in time is Revelation 3? three talking about is it choice a here or is it choice b here in other words sixth seal or seventh bowl because the sixth seal is the time of testing the seventh trumpet is the time of grading and the seventh bowl is the time has come to possess the kingdom when you understand that that when you understand those three things those three events <clears throat> those three stages Daniel chapter 7 makes a lot more sense. You have the time of testing, all right, the time of Jacob's trouble, starting from the sixth seal and ending at the end of the sixth bowl. But before it even ends, the grading actually occurs, or the judgment, says uh, Daniel 7. The grading or judging by Father occurs really at the seventh trumpet. Now the day of the Lord will continue on, but the time will come to possess the kingdom because Father makes the, that verdict judgment after he's done grading the nation of Israel. He'll, uh, the time will come to possess the kingdom at the seventh bowl, approximately six weeks after the judgment of the seventh trumpet period. The Revelation 3.3 3 says, Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. This is not talking about the appearing of Jesus Christ. This is talking about the day that will uh, climax, if you will, into the return, the appearing of Jesus Christ, when the it is done is screamed in Revelation 16, 15, before the throne. Okay. Okay. Or 1617 sorry so I will come upon you as a thief you need to be thinking about father coming and visiting to start the curse and then returning to heaven and we're going to look at Hosea 2 and Hosea 5 in just a second so that is that's not the moment that Satan is cast to earth. Satan is cast to earth about 17 months. And there's, there's ways that we can calculate that based on all the how long countdowns and prophecies like Isaiah 20 and Isaiah 16. And uh, if you've ever seen my timelines, you'll see how I came up with that. And I've recently had to tweak it a little bit. And the length of the fifth seal is a little longer than I thought it was. And the length of the first four trumpets is a little shorter than I thought it was. So some of that time I had devoted for the first four trumpets actually belong in the fifth seal. And I, and I found that out once I truly understood Jeremiah 1 verse 11 and Ecclesiastes 12 verse 5 about the sign of the almond blossom. And how the day of the Lord 
will begin in the month of February, most likely late February, when the blossom comes on the almond trees in Israel. And uh, Jeremiah was told by, by God, what do you see? And he said, the blossom, you know, of an almond tree. And, they, and God said, well said, and I will now begin my work, right? The day of the Lord. So it's going to be a late February event. Don't be surprised that Father gives us the calendar month. He gave it to us thousands of years ago. And people are just now, I think, beginning to understand that that is an actual sign giving us the calendar month of the start of the day of the Lord when God will come upon uh, the world, but primarily Israel, as a thief. But if you, and, and this won't come upon you as a thief. If you're a Messianic Christian in Israel and you've studied the last days and you've been taught by people who's been appointed as watchmen, this won't come upon you as a thief. In fact, you'll already be hiding in the place prepared by God for probably 16 months already by the time this, this comes upon the world, especially Israel. Because the curse is coming upon Israel. It will affect not only their neighbors, but it will also affect the rest of the world. Because when Israel gets done drinking the cup of madness, guess what? It's everybody else's turn. They get judged first. So, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Uh, you got a lot of things from the book of Revelation that's going to occur long before this. So, no, the start of the day of the Lord, which again is from the sixth seal through the end of the sixth bowl, and then the great day of the Lord that begins uh, at the appearing of Jesus at the seventh bowl, that battle of the great day of God Almighty is the great day of the Lord. And, uh, but none of this should come as a thief to those who study the Bible, who are students of the Bible. Uh, again, you already have the people fleeing at the start of the fifth seal following the abomination of desolation event. That's what Jesus warned about in Matthew 24. Um, and you see it there, of course, in Daniel 11. They're already going to be fleeing to the place prepared by God. But then when Satan arrives on the scene, there's no more fleeing. You're stuck like Chuck, and you're going to have to deal with Satan in Israel, especially uh, in Judea and Jerusalem. So, again, the question is, which moment in time is Revelation 3.3 talking about? Choice A or choice B? Well, choice A is uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 2 through 4. This is not talking about uh, the appearing of Jesus. This is talking about the day that will eventually unfold and bring about the appearing of Jesus. But it's talking about the curse, the promised curse of Deuteronomy 32. It's also the curse mentioned in the 9-11 passage of Daniel. Daniel 9, verse 11, the curse and the oath promised on the last generation of Israel which will help uh, purge away and take away their dross and alloy, says Isaiah chapter 1. That's what 1 Thessalonians is talking about. It's not talking about the appearing of Jesus. It's talking about the day that will bring about the, the appearing of Jesus, but it also brings the judgment upon Israel. It's time for them to reap the harvest of their deeds. For, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So what has confused great men of God for centuries about this verse? Well, they think the day of the Lord does not even start until the appearing of Jesus Christ on the last day. Do you see what I mean? They think it's like, okay, Jesus appears at the start of the day of the Lord, and he renders his wrath on all of his enemies and adversaries, and... Uh, so we're out of here. We're changed into our immortal, new, incorruptible living bodies before the day of the Lord is unleashed on planet Earth. See, they thought that and they were wrong. And a lot of them are still wrong today. The day of the Lord 
starts off with the wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. First four trumpets, then the three woes, fifth trumpet, sixth trumpet, seventh trumpet, is the fierce anger of the Lord on his people. Then at the seventh bowl appearing of Jesus, battle of the great day of God Almighty, now the time has come to possess the kingdom and to take it back from Satan, okay, get to give Jesus his inheritance, the holy people in the holy city Jerusalem. Um, then you have the great day of the Lord. So 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 2 through 4 is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, the curse and the oath, six sealed through the end of the sixth bowl. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. The who's the they and the them? It's Israel. There's no doubt that in 1 Thessalonians 5, it's talking about Israel, and it's talking about all of Israel except for Christians. You understand, the day of the Lord is comes from Father, and he's not bringing it upon the Christians of Israel. Because Jesus' blood has washed away their sins. Do you understand? So the followers of God the Father's Son, Jesus, are not appointed to this wrath, this wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people. That's what's meant by 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Father's saying, hey, I know you're there. All right, I know you're there. I have to clean up Israel. Okay? And Father's saying, in my mind, I'm bringing this upon Israel, but I know you're there amongst them. Okay? And I'm going to use you during this time, followers of my son, but I'm not bringing this spanking this chastisement on you i know you're there now what i'm going to do for you followers of my son is um if you do your due diligence and study this before this day comes it won't come upon you as a thief all right because i'm going to send you elijah at daniel 11:36. at the same time i'm sending you or casting to earth satan I'm also sending you Elijah, all right? And you're going to have like 16 months from the, the time Elijah shows up until the day that I bring this upon Israel. So you've got 16 months to prepare. But you don't have that long to get to the place of safety that I'm preparing for you. In Revelation 12's place prepared by God in the Judean wilderness, or maybe even on the Jordan side of the Dead Sea. So either it's somewhere in ancient Judah boundaries, which today includes parts of Jordan and Israel, somewhere in that area, I'm going to prepare a place for you. But you got to get there by the day that I send Elijah to you, because I'm also casting Satan to earth that same day. So you'll have between the fifth seal abomination of desolation event in Jerusalem, you'll have 30 days to get out of Dodge. But don't think, well, I got plenty of time to go back and pack my things. That's not true because the transportation that I'm providing for you, I'm paraphrasing God's word, the transportation that I'm preparing for you is not going to hang around for 30 days. You may only have a day two days, three days, to get on board that transportation that I'm preparing for you. And then you need to know 30 days later, I'm bringing Satan to earth. And then whoever is stuck like Chuck in Israel, in Jerusalem, they'll at least have the two witnesses there, all right, to help teach them what's about to happen. But as far as using your passport to fly out of Israel or Jerusalem, that's probably not going to be permitted by Satan. So you're probably going to be stuck like Chuck. Do you understand? And then you're going to be put on trial. You Christians who are left behind, Satan's wrath is still coming upon you. But my wrath isn't. But I'm going to use you, and some of you will die. 
That's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. You, the ones who don't flee in time, who are going to be stuck like Chuck at the appearing of Satan and Elijah and Moses, uh, the two witnesses, um, when all this goes down, you're going to have to, you, your testimony is going to have to be given. And some of you will die a martyr's death. Others will just suffer persecution and you'll be put in prison for what you're speaking on the streets. Uh, you won't be able to buy or sell. Uh, the mark of, of the beast will be administered. Make sure you don't take it. If so, you're going to die a wicked man's death at my son's hand when he comes. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 4, again, is talking about the entire day of the Lord. That does not start when Satan is cast to earth at Daniel 11, 36. It starts at Daniel 11, 40b. Did you hear what I said? 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 4 is Daniel 11, 40b, when the Antichrist horde locust-like army passes through Israel en route to Egypt and is basically taken over the eastern Mediterranean Sea and the trade routes like the Red Sea. And uh, the Antichrist is on the move again. He went on the move at the first seal. This time he's actually going to pass through Israel and begin taking them as slaves and killing the majority of them. That's that sudden destruction has come upon them. It's Israel, but it's the Israel who are not followers of Jesus. Now, if there's Christians still there, um, then it's coming upon you too, but it's not you're not appointed for this because you are followers of my son. So again, uh, a lot of you are going to get out. I'm preparing a place. But if you either choose to stay behind or you're not watching close enough, you're going to have to give a testimony. I'm sorry, but I'm going to use it for your good and the world's good. And many of you will die a martyr's death. Now, there'll be Christian martyrs on all seven continents. Hallelujah. But the Bible, when talking about, even in Revelation, when talking about this last seven-year period before the kingdom comes, before Jesus appears, it's really focusing in on Jerusalem. You've got to realize that. And Father does that on purpose. It's all about Jerusalem. It's about his son's inheritance. All right? He loves the Christians of America. He loves Christians of of uh, Australia. He loves the Christians in the Far East. Okay, he loves you. But this prize that this is all about is Jerusalem. All right, Jesus getting back what belongs to him. And the time is coming for him to receive his inheritance. And Satan is working hard to steal it from Jesus. So that's choice A. I call it the time of testing. Um, the testing uh, for the nation of Israel, the hour of trial, starts on the day that sudden destruction comes upon them. But if the mark of the beast is being implemented during the fifth seal, then you're actually being tested then as well. But, but the phrase, the hour of trial, seen here in Revelation 3, 10 through 12, and... Uh, and this sudden destruction at noonday, Jerusalem time, when Israel is attacked, about 16 months after Satan arrives, about 17 months after the abomination of desolation event, to start the day of the Lord that comes like a thief. All right? That's also, that's when, when the real testing is going on. So the exact moment the mark of the beast is implemented, either during mid-fifth seal, late-fifth seal, uh, first trumpet, I'm not really sure. But I know in Daniel 11.39, which is the verse right before the sudden destruction of Daniel 11.40b, Daniel 11.39 sure seems like it's talking about the mark of the beast to me. So it may be something that gets implemented late in the fifth seal. Now, what was what is choice B? The seventh bowl appearing of Jesus Christ. That's found in Revelation 16, verses 15 through 16. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Notice how that's worded differently than 1 Thessalonians 5. Okay. 
Let's back up to Revelation 3.3. Here it's worded, I will come upon you as a thief. 1 Thessalonians 5, it's worded, the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And then Revelation 16, 15 and 16 says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. So people try to figure out if these are all the same event that, it's, that occurs on the same day. And the answer is no. No. Jesus comes during the day of the Lord. When I say he comes, I'm talking about Jesus is appearing in glory. When they can look up in, in the wedding hall. Good and bad invited guests can look up and see the face of him who sits on the throne. See, that's the climax to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is here, six seal through six bowl, and then the seventh bowl is to behold, I am coming as a thief. But Revelation 3 says, I will come upon you as a thief. You need to think of that more as what Father is talking about in Hosea 2 and Hosea 5. In other words, I'm coming to visit you. That's You need to be thinking like Father talking, right? They're one. I'm not trying to say they're not one, but this is more Father. I come upon you as a thief, O Israel. You know, this is Isaiah 1. I'm going to clean you up before I give you to my son. All right? And, uh, and then this, of course, is Jesus' actual coming at the seventh bowl. When the time comes to possess the kingdom mentioned in Daniel 7. See? This is the Daniel was watching the events. Of, I'm, I'm referring to Dan, the wording of Daniel 7 here. This is Daniel watching all of this. What's the length of this from the sixth seal through the end of the sixth bowl? I used to say 945 days. I now believe it's 825 days because the length of the fifth seal is longer than I thought and the first four trumpets is shorter than I thought based on the sign of the almond blossom in Jeremiah 111 and Ecclesiastes 12.5. So we've got more fifth seal time than we do the, the first four trumpets that are going to come first four trumpet judgments are going to come pretty quick. I used to think it would take 12 months, the year of their punishment, but it's, it's going to be less than 12 months, uh, probably more like uh, eight months or such. Um, so hopefully you see the difference now between Revelation 3.3, 3, 1 Thessalonians 5, and Revelation 16 in reference to coming as a thief. I hope you see the difference now. If you really want to understand why Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I am coming as a thief, in reference to Jesus' actual appearing when he's brought by Father on the cherub of Ezekiel 1. If you want to understand why the coming of Jesus, why he says, I am coming as a thief, then you need to read these verses. Zephaniah 3, 8, Isaiah 33, 4, Jeremiah 30, verse 16, Isaiah 11, verse 14, Ezekiel 39, verse 10, Jeremiah 49, verse 32, and Zephaniah 2, verse 9. If you read those, you'll understand why Jesus is coming as a thief, what he's going to be taking back from Satan's kingdom, okay? Why he's coming to plunder, right? Why Zephaniah 3, 8 says, wait on me. This is Jesus talking. You wait on me until the day I rise up to take plunder, all right, to get back what was stolen from my inheritance. All right, that's, so that's what's going on there. Uh, Revelation 3, verses 10 through 12 says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. This is Jesus talking to Christians. Uh, we like to think he's talking to Christians around the world, but you know he's really talking to Christians within Israel within Jerusalem, within Judea. That doesn't mean that we're not involved, but this is a, really a conversation for the, and you say, well, that's the faithful church. You know, that's the Christians um, in Western Turkey that he's talking to. Well, this is, he wasn't, he knew they weren't going to be alive during the 70th week of Daniel. So he's talking to them because he's talking generically to Christians. But this is really a message in the last days for the Christians within Israel. 
I'm not saying only them, but you need to be thinking about this stuff being Israel focused, Jerusalem focused. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now sometimes the earth doesn't mean the whole planet, doesn't mean the whole inhabited world. Sometimes the earth in the Bible is just talking about Israel. Sometimes it's just talking about the Middle East between the seas, Red Sea, Black Sea, White Sea, Pale Sea. You know, the Mediterranean Sea, the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf. Sometimes it's just talking about that area. Okay. But here we have something called the hour of trial. Is the hour of trial starting when Satan arrives early on in the fifth seal? Or does the hour of trial start when the sudden destruction comes upon Israel like a thief? I believe that the hour of trial, I used to say it's when Satan arrives, but I now believe that Revelation 3 verses 10 through 12 is talking about the same thing that Revelation 3 verse 3 is, all right? And that is the day of the Lord, that Father visits his people when he sends the Antichrist army to pass through Israel, that starts the hour of trial not the moment that Satan appears, you know, 16 months earlier. You got it? So believe me, there's going to be some Christians tested, you know, you could say during the fifth seal. But he's not bringing the hour of trial. Father is not appointing Christians in Israel to undergo testing. I hope you caught what I said. Father is not appointing Christians to go under testing by Satan during the fifth seal. Now their testimony, Christians' testimony, Christians who didn't flee in time, their beautiful testimony will be used by Father to help the gospel spread throughout the world. When people are watching during the fifth seal uh, on TV, the events of Israel and the Christians being lined up and, and scourged and thrown in jail and brought before the local judges and synagogues and the priest, okay? And their testimony will be used by God. And they're stuck like Chuck, and it'll be a beautiful aroma to Almighty God. Their, their wonderful testimony, and they will be well rewarded for it throughout eternity. But they're not appointed to be tested. Okay, but this wrath, this appointed wrath, is the hour of trial, which is the sudden destruction that comes at noonday, which we just read about in 1 Thessalonians 5, but you could also read more about that in Amos chapter 8, I think it's verse 9. All right, hallelujah. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Now, is that behold, I am coming quickly the same as the behold, I am coming as a thief? I think so. And I drew an arrow over there. Okay. So we're talking about the day of the Lord, which is the hour of trial, but it will climax into the appearing of Jesus Christ. So here's Jesus talking to Christians in the future, 2,000 years later. He knows who this is really for. All right, all Christians throughout two, the last 2,000 years can draw strength from Revelation 3, but this is really meant for Christians in Israel who are going to have to not only put up with Satan during the fifth seal, but they're going to have to put up because they didn't flee in time. They're going to have to put up with the day of the Lord that's going to come upon Israel. It's, they're not appointed for all this. But the Lord Jesus is basically in verse 11 saying, hey, hang on, hang on. You know, it won't last forever. Again, how long do I think based on all the prophecies I've put together on a timeline? My personal understanding now is the length from sixth seal through the end of the sixth bowl is 825 days. But don't forget from the moment Satan arrives in the fifth seal to the end of the fifth seal is an additional 16 months. So if you counted from the time Satan arrived in Daniel 11.36 all the way up until Daniel 11.45, which is the appearing of Jesus Christ, 
right? That's that Zechariah 14 moment. That whole length is 825 days plus 16 months. And how do, how do, uh, do we need to break out a calculator for that? Not really, because you have Daniel 12's prophecy of the 1,335 days. So from the fifth seal, abomination of desolation, to start the fifth seal, which is Daniel 11, 29 through 35, until Daniel 11, 45, is 1,335 days. But Matthew 24 says that that prophecy, that how long countdown from the fifth seal to the seventh bull is 1,335, but it shall be shortened for the sake of the elect. So who knows? 1333, 1330, it's going to be shortened by a few days. Now, behold, I am coming quickly. You know, people have gotten that wrong for 2,000 years. They think, uh, you know, you, the whole preterist movement started because of verses like this. All oh, that must be talking about 70 AD. No, when the Lord says, I am coming quickly, and I am coming with, I say the Lord, let's get specific here. When Jesus is telling his followers in Israel, you know, you're going to have to put up with all this stuff because you didn't flee in time, but that's okay. I still love you. And I'm so, don't worry. I'm going to get you through this. The Holy Spirit's going to get you through it. You might die a martyr's death, but you're, you will be standing with me at the moment of my appearing in your new living. So, you know, you'll be the one who's still standing when the, when the fire of brimstone and, uh, uh, you know, when fire and brimstone is being poured out on Israel and Jerusalem, don't worry, you're going to be standing alive during it. So you're not really dying. Uh, but what's meant by I am coming quickly, I'm coming as a thief. You have to realize that when Jesus comes, he's coming as multiple things. Am I blowing your mind? He's coming as high priest. He's coming as commander of the Lord's army. We see that in Revelation 19 and many other places in the Bible, Joel 3, uh, Isaiah 13. All right, Jesus is coming as commander of the Lord's army. And what does a commander do when he attacks? He attacks quickly, suddenly, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Boom, look up above you, you tares of Israel, you tares of the Middle East. Look up above you because Jesus is here. And he's about to destroy you. All right, so it's an attack by a military commander. He also comes back as high priest. He's going to offer the dead bodies uh, as a sacrifice to his father, primarily the animals that they're going to be bringing with them, that which, listen to me, brothers and sisters, which are mentioned in Ezekiel 39. The rams, the goats, the oxen, the fatted cattle, all these things that this horde army trying to take Jerusalem, all these animals that they're bringing with them, whether they're alive or whether they're just in frozen trucks coming uh, behind in support of the army, however that plays out, all of that's going to be cooked as, as part of the marriage supper of the lamb to feed the starving birds and the animals on the carcasses of the men and all of the meat and all of the animal meat is going to be offered as a sacrifice to his father. I am preparing a slaughter, okay? A feast of choice pieces, Isaiah 25. That's what all that's talking about. That's what the marriage supper of the lamb is. It's to feed, listen to me, it's to feed the 10% holy stump. That's going to be in hiding. These foolish virgins who are not changed into an immortal body that are going to come out from hiding. From Bethany or uh, uh, from the clefts of the rocks in the wilderness. Here, here comes this 10% holy stump mentioned in Isaiah 4 and Isaiah 6. And the Bible says that 7 out of 8 of them are going to be women and children. Okay, They need to be fed. That's what the marriage supper of the Lamb is. Now, we, as priests to God, priests to Jesus and his Father, we've just been changed into an immortal body. Are we going to be eating the animals that the Antichrist army brought with them? After Jesus blows fire and brimstone on them and breaks them apart in pieces using his tempest and his whirlwinds and his medicanes coming out of the Mediterranean Sea? Yes. 
people, but we may even be helping serve. Do you, do you see what I mean? Just like the disciples, the 5,000. We, we may be going out and helping these uh, seven out of eight people, the 10% holy stump, which are women and children, we may be helping them start their fires, gather up the meat, all right? Put it up on the rocks, get the fire started. Now, I'm assuming there, okay, those are my words, all right? But it's not my words that those animals are going to be offered as a sacrifice. That's not my words, but saying that we're going to help build the fires and help gather up the meat, now that I don't know for sure. But I think that the, the prophecies and the parables and the events that happened during the, the um, time of Jesus' ministry serve as examples of what's going to happen. I can see us, like the 12 disciples, helping feed, you know, all of this 10% holy stump that comes out of hiding, all right? The foolish virgins who did not take the mark of the beast, remain faithful to Jesus' father, Yah, the Holy One of Israel. So what else do I have for you? Let's look down here. Revelation 3, 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And, of course, that's talking about the overcoming of Satan mentioned in Revelation 12, verses 10 through 11. That's why I have these combined. Revelation 3, Revelation 12. All right, in other words, do not worship Satan. The world won't know it's Satan. They're going to bow before him. The, the vast majority of the world, not every single person, because there's going to be some left alive from all seven continents. We see that in Isaiah 66, verses 18 through 21. There's going to be people who are not converted into an immortal body still left alive. There's going to be people who are mark-free. Not to mention the ten kings who are going to be permitted to live. I imagine they're all mark free too. And they're going to turn against the beast, even though they've been fornicating with her for many, many uh, months and a few years. And they are going to turn against her and help thresh her uh, during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, says Revelation 17. But uh, Revelation uh, uh, 12 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. So a lot of them are going to be martyred. Okay, and Jesus told you that in Matthew 24. He's telling, it, telling you it uh, again in Revelation 12. Okay. Don't think that I am not with, still with you. All right? Just, you know, there's a reason why a lot of this innocent blood has to be shed. Brothers and sisters, have you ever read the fifth seal passage of uh, Revelation 6? Right? Let's go there real quick. Because this blows people's minds so bad, they don't even want to teach it in church. And if they teach it in church, they teach it incorrectly. And they confuse this with the wrath of God. This isn't the wrath of God. That's the day of the Lord, to purge away and take away Israel's dross. But the fifth seal passage ends right here. Then a white robe was given to each one of them, talking about martyrs, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. In other words, you're not getting your new immortal body until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Father knows every hair on your head. He knows everyone in advance who's going to be martyred. He knows that number. All right. And until the last martyr has been martyred, uh, Jesus isn't coming back. Now, the it is done in Revelation 16, 15, that shouted in heaven just before Father brings Jesus at the seventh bowl. 
that's not talking about the it is done, meaning that we've reached that number of martyrs. That's not what the it is done is. The it is done is talking about the day of the Lord has finished its job and it has purged away and taken away Israel's dross and alloy. So don't confuse the it is done with this. But there's a reason why this is in the Bible for us in the last days. All right. If Father's working everything out so that there are going to be people who don't flee in time, who don't get out of the wicked cities around the world in time, and there's going to be a lot of martyrdom. And that's what you see in chapters like Revelation 7. All right, That's not a rapture. That's not the raising of the dead. Those people dressed in white are these people who come to heaven, their soul arrives in heaven still crying. The cry of the martyrs. You need to understand that. So don't kid yourself in teaching that there's not going to be at least hundreds of thousands of martyrs worldwide and probably uh, thousands of thousands in Israel. A lot of Messianic Christians aren't going to make it out in time. They're not going to flee in time. Some of them are going to choose to stay behind and die a martyr's death and just to serve the Lord and get this testimony out of the gospel up until the moment that their vocal cords are sliced. There's going to be people that actually know they're in danger are going to choose to stay. Or maybe they have loved ones that don't believe and they want to use the remaining months to stay behind to try to help get them converted to Christianity before it's too late to keep them from taking the mark. There's going to be people left behind. And that's what the real left behind means. It's talking about people in Israel who don't flee to the place prepared by God in time. That's how the left behind phrase should be taught. Not the way it's been taught over the last 20 years, 30 years. All right? There's no pre-trib rapture. There's no mid-trib rapture. There's not. There's the gathering, the mustering of the Lord's army. When the commander of the Lord's army shows up quickly, suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, at the seventh bowl. But yeah, you need to know that that verse is there. So, let's uh, see what I have for you here. A question. Is the they in Revelation 12, 11, this they right here, and they overcame him, Satan, is the they there the same they that is over here? Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, the them and the theys, are they the, talking about the same people? Right. Um, in other words, are they just talking about Christians in Jerusalem? And the answer is no. Revelation 12, 11 is not just talking about people from the nation of Israel. It is talking about the people mentioned in Revelation 12, 17. Okay, so let's go there. Revelation 12, verse 17. That's who the they are in Revelation 12, 11. Who are the they and the thems? Let's go to verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So that's throughout the world. Um, now, this is referring to the place prepared by God. The, some Christians get out in time, and they won't suffer any persecution because they'll be at a certain cavern or a uh, a certain uh, place like uh, something similar to Petra or similar to the Fords and the Arnon, even though the Fords and the Arnon, for those of you who realize that it's mentioned in Isaiah 16, that's talking about during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, not the main part of the day of the Lord. Isaiah 16, Fords and the Arnon, which I used to think was the place prepared by God, <clears throat> it's not. It's, it's just a place of safety to go for foolish virgins when the ten kings are threshing the beast in the Middle East and possibly around the world. 
be cities. So, uh, going went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Maybe that's just talking about going. His, his soldiers are going down the Jordanian highway, the, the Jordanian king's highway south of Amman, Jordan. And then he realizes, you know, when the earthquake and the ground opens up and the sinkhole destroys his uh, army that he sent after the Christians who fled in time. And maybe they just simply, uh, he gives up on them and he goes back to persecuting the Christians in Israel who didn't make it out in time. That may be what this means, but I think it's, it's also involving the sixth trumpet period when the 200 million jihadists go throughout the seven continents looking for those who won't bow before their God. Kind of scary stuff, isn't it? And that's why a lot of people wish that they're going to be raptured out at the first seal. Well, I wish I was too, but it's not going to happen. But we're not appointed to the day of the Lord. Christians in Israel aren't appointed to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord comes upon Israel as a whole, but not, not, it's not meant for the followers of Jesus. It's meant for the purpose of Isaiah 1. Hallelujah. Let's finish up this study. What do I have for you over in this bottom left-hand corner? Daniel 7, uh, verses 21 through 22. Remember, Daniel 7 is telling us what's going on at the throne room of heaven beginning at Daniel eleven thirty six. that's Daniel 7 verse 8 when the Satan is cast to earth and now the Antichrist who's being possessed by Satan begins speaking blasphemies and pompous words that's the clue that the 42 month period that leads up to the seventh trumpet not the seventh bowl is over uh, excuse me not over it has begun Daniel 7 verse 8. Here in Daniel 7, uh, again, we have the 24 elders and God the Father watching what's going on on planet Earth when Satan is cast to Earth. And then 16 months after Satan is cast to Earth, then Father does Hosea 2 and Hosea 5. We're going to cover that. All right, just remember that. So Father's going to visit 16 months later his people and bring about and orchestrate the start of the day of the Lord, which is the attack on Israel, the passing through the Antichrist and his massive horde army. Uh, it's given a few names in the Bible. Uh, one name that it's given is found in Isaiah 7. It is the hired razor fly in the bee army, right? The Assyrian alliance consisting of nations even as far south as Ethiopia and Sudan at the sixth seal that come against the nation of Israel. It's the Assyrian alliance that helps and guards the children of Lot of Psalm 83. So Ezekiel 38, Psalm 83 are the same attack on Israel. There's only one. Now you read the first four uh, seals in Daniel 11. And Israel's being damaged a little bit here and there. But the actual massive attack so huge upon Israel where that Israel won't even go out to fight. I know it sounds like I'm giving strength to Israel's enemies, but the Bible actually says they won't even go out to fight. The IDF will be so overwhelmed, everyone's just going to don sackcloth and roll around in the ashes and cry out to God. But it's too late. Once the curse has started, it can't be stopped. Father will not pull it back. And two-thirds of Israel is about to die, says Zechariah 13. I know it sounds like I'm wishing ill will on Israel. I'm not. Daniel 7, 21 through 22. Pay attention to the different colors that I have for you, the different font. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Okay, who are the saints? Well, here the saints are talking about Christians in Israel, especially Jerusalem. Remember the ones who don't flee in time, get to the place prepared by God in time. Satan says in Revelation 12, we just read about it, that he's going to go back. I believe he's talking about Israel specifically, at least at first. He's going to go back to Israel and start making war against the Christians who are left behind and trying to round them up. So 
That's what this is talking about. But he remember, it's also the Christians are going to be persecuted throughout the world, not just Israel. Until the uh, making war and against the saints and prevailing against them, that's, of course, the fifth seal passage of Revelation 6, until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. That's the seventh trumpet. I have a little arrow going here and calling it day 1290. That's the seventh trumpet. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. That's not until the seventh bowl. And you might say, well, why doesn't God just possess the kingdom at the seventh trumpet? Why does he wait the additional 45 days that shall be shortened? Because you must have the gathering of the nations to Armageddon and the mountains of Israel. They come to Jesus to be judged. He doesn't necessarily go throughout the world to them. In fact, Isaiah 27, 12 says Jesus stays local in the Middle East when he's threshing. He does not go to Cleveland to thresh. Now, the ten kings might be used to go to Cleveland to thresh. Of Revelation 17, but Jesus in Isaiah 27, 12 is just staying local in the Middle East as he's passing over to thresh. So, this color is the seventh trumpet. This color, a little darker font, is the seventh bowl. Day 1290 versus day 1335. The 42-month period ends at day 1290. That's when the judgment was made in favor of the saints. But Father doesn't bring Jesus yet until the nations are in place. The invited guest of Matthew 22. Hallelujah. Father is working things out so that the exact number of the faithful Israeli uh, Christians needed to become martyrs will be reached on day 1290 from the fifth seal abomination of desolation event. This is what is meant by Revelation 611, which we read. So you have the time of testing, the time of grading is actually at the seventh trumpet, and the time to possess the kingdom is the seventh bowl. Uh, the wrath that we... Our Christians are not appointed for is to purge away and take away Israel's dross and alloy which I mentioned in Isaiah 1 it's also found in Zechariah 13 Hosea 2 9 I said you got to incorporate Hosea 2 and 5 into the study of the day of the Lord or you'll never understand it is the is the in secret return of the Most High at the sixth seal to bring the day of the Lord upon Israel and the world the Most High will start it and then return to his throne until Israel acknowledges their offenses. So people will say, God's coming at the sixth seal. And I used to say, no, God doesn't come until the seventh bowl. I used to say that. But no, God does come at the sixth seal. It's not the wrath of the Lamb. It's the day that will bring about the wrath of the Lamb. That's why the sixth seal passage is written the way it is, to identify the day. So you know that that, prom that day that's been promised by all the prophets of Israel throughout the uh, centuries, that day that Israel feared has now come. So Father does actually come, but he remains cloaked. You can't see him, but his presence is on the earth. And he begins to orchestrate the curse. He brings, like a hook in the jaw, he brings Gog the Assyrian out of the north. All right? So... I never worded it like that until I read Hosea 2 and Hosea 5. Father does come at the sixth seal. He doesn't bring Jesus. You can't see the face of Father. But he brings, uh, he comes and he, he rides on the clouds and he orchestrates the start of the day of the Lord. And then he returns to his place. you got to catch that. In Hosea 5, 15, even though Father the Ancient of Days will render a judgment at the seventh trumpet in favor of the saints, he will not return again in power, bringing Jesus, uh, and it's the actual appearing of Jesus, until the time comes to give the kingdom to the saints. So let's end this lesson by looking at Hosea 2, 9 and Hosea 5, 15. Hosea, Hosea 2, 9. Therefore, I will return and take away. All right. That's the day of the Lord's coming like a thief. Things are going to be taken from Israel. They're about to be plundered. Do you understand? This is Father saying, this is my doing. I'm orchestrating this. Therefore, I will return and take away my grain in its time. This is the curse of Daniel chapter 9, verse 
verse 11. The 9-11 passage of Daniel is found here in Hosea 2-9. Therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season. He's talking about these judgments of the day of the Lord that's going to come upon Israel. And will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. All right, now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. Until what? The it is done is screamed in Revelation 16, 15. Or 16, 17. I will also cause all my mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons. I will destroy her vines. He's not talking about Babylon. He's talking about his people. All right. These are my wages that my lovers have given me, you know, is what she said. So anyways... It's time to uncover Israel's nakedness in front of all the surrounding peoples and evil neighbors that she's cheated with. Uh, that's it. But notice, you know, he, he will return to do that to her to begin orchestrating the day of the Lord. That's a future prophecy, brothers and sisters. Let's look at Hosea 5.15, which also needs to be taught on the subject of teaching the day of the Lord. I will return again to my place till or until they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face because they don't care. Israel can care less about God the Father now or God the Son. In their affliction, they shall earnestly seek me. But Father's not going to hold back. Once the curse starts, it can't be stopped. And Zechariah 13 gives you the stats on how bad it's going to uh, be in Israel. Two out of three are going to die, women and children and men. One third will be taken into slavery, but you will have that 10% holy stump hiding in the clefts of the rocks. Uh, and I will return again to my place. You see, Father comes at the sixth seal. He orchestrates the events of Gog the Assyrian and passing through Israel. He starts things in motion. He started telling his angels, make sure you bring these judgments on Israel. And then he returns, and then that's when that's what Daniel 7 is, right? You know, he returns. He's already, thrones have already been in place for 16 months, watching the events in Jerusalem when, when Satan is cast to earth. So 16 months go by, Father decides now it's time. He comes, orchestrates the passing through of Gog the Assyrian, and then he goes, gets things started and gives his angels instructions, and he goes back to the throne room where the 24 elders are, and he keeps watching until the time comes to award the kingdom right? Hallelujah. Well, brothers and sisters, let's end this lesson. I hope you'll share this study tool. I hope the day of the Lord makes a lot more sense to you now. Um, this is it, brothers and sisters. Make sure you incorporate Hosea 2 and Hosea 5, and I can't wait to see you next time. God bless.